announcement of, for Bath and Land, um, QIA, and, and certainly there's great expectations around the performance of that IIVA, and which is shared by all IIVA or IVA signatories across the country, uh, including for the original Ragman Agreement. Uh, so my interest is in trying to understand the conditions under which IVAs essentially work for communities. And, and as Chris pointed out, uh, RESDA went through a thoughtful, deliberate process of identifying knowledge gaps in consultation with, with uh, different stakeholders, and, and I certainly benefited from uh, especially the White Horse meeting when, when I was able to solicit and then got many responses from, from stakeholders, government, communities, in terms of what they thought was, was critical. And so we uh, identified a whole series of, of knowledge gaps, and from those uh, selected, selected a, a few. Uh, the ones that I'm responding, the, the research that I'm, uh, that I'm completing responds to uh, questions around IBA negotiation and implementation, and as well with respect to IBA effectiveness. So questions like, to what degree are IBA negotiations informed by well-conceived and inclusive community visioning exercises? How well do they capture interests of community health? How much information sharing occurs among communities, and how does this impact IBA negotiations? And then how can IBAs in tandem with other governance mechanisms, such as health impact assessment, do a better job of adaptively managing emergent community health issues? There's, that's probably one of the greatest concerns I heard, is that IBAs are too much a static instrument, and there's too little adaptive management going on as problems emerge. So let me show you a little bit about how we've been responding to, to some of these. On the whole question of knowledge sharing, this is one of the most significant areas of, of effort by academics. Uh, as Chris pointed out a year ago, we had a focus on knowledge mobilization. We have historically been terrible at it, uh, and, and we are slowly getting better, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and so uh, to that end, I'd like to distribute even just uh, a sheet. Actually, Suzanne, I, I left it there. I think, are you next? You'll find it. Just pass it around. If you want a copy of this presentation and links to other uh, links to, to some of the outputs that I'm noting, please uh, just check your name off and I'll make sure that we get it to you. But there's so many good things going on in terms of knowledge sharing. Many people will know about the IBA Community Toolkit developed by Ginger Gibson and Karen Parkerby. Uh, and Section 2 and 3 in particular focuses on, on negotiations and how critical community visioning is. Uh, there are so many interesting initiatives, uh, Thierry's work as well, so I did a little little one, Thierry, down the bottom right corner, and we have two teams. Uh, you know, the Upper Government has been generous in, in sending Teresa Howlett to various meetings to share some of uh, their the NG's experiences with implementing the Boise Bay IPA. So there's quite a bit going on, and we've also tried to contribute through some knowledge needs uh, responding to some knowledge needs and generating some, some posters. Uh, this was one that was developed primarily for Baker Lake, but has been uh, distributed further, which is on what do we know about the impacts of two week on, two week off schedules. And importantly, if we look at, at scholarship uh, from a number of jurisdictions, there are of course some opportunities that are presented as well as obviously some real uh, concerns associated with family relations, stress, etc. So uh, using a systematic review approach, we have tried to do justice to the whole breadth of literature that exists. And of course, there are some interesting findings around uh, renewal of traditional activities because of the, the time and money that's, that's there. But of course, quite typically, it's done with more modern equipment. So there's some interesting questions about whether going out on the land with a satellite phone is, 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 uh, is sort of a return to the past. Um, because not many people like to read posters, we also, um, for example, in Baker Lake, we're running radio shows uh, translated, and, and those were successful uh, in some community events in, in other jurisdictions. Uh, we are fortunate to get uh, some funding from uh, Agnigo Eagle Mines, who paid for a, a, a feast, uh, and, and so we were able to bring in some of the elders to share with them some of the work we were doing and, and solicit feedback on the utility of some of the some of the products. Uh, so that's ongoing work to try and uh, disseminate some existing knowledge. 
the questions around IBA effectiveness were these three. How are IBAs benefiting communities? Are they meeting their explicit and quite critically their implicit aims? Too many interests that are uh, conceived of by communities in, in their IBA negotiations are ne never given sufficient voice. They're just assumed to be sort of part and parcel of an IBA, and, and quite often they, they don't get built in, of course. Uh, what methods are suitable for gauging effectiveness, which was something that Thierry addresses in terms of... And then the, the, the billion dollar question for Chris and others is, can mining when undertaken with IBAs contribute to sustainable community economic development? What conditions must be present? And you heard me hammering that point yesterday, so sorry for repeating that. Uh, the work here has been a, an effort to um, build upon the early work that was done in the Northwest Territories in response to the three diamond mines, there, there's a, quite a comprehensive monitoring program in place uh, through the socioeconomic agreements to look at, at, at how particular socioeconomic conditions are changing. Uh, and we certainly know that, that there's a, a growth in, in wealth, uh, especially as measured by things like tax filers with incomes of more than 50,000. There's been a reduction in unemployment. And this is, um, the rates of change have been more significant than those in the rest of the NWT or the rest of Canada. So we have a a crude sense that, that economically at least, and, and education levels, things are getting better in those communities impacted by the, the diamond mines. Uh, but there's a sense that we had to do more to understand uh, the impacts on well-being. Um, and and uh, Kathleen Kanash and a, and a colleague at NAHO, which someone mentioned yesterday no longer exists, uh, did a thoughtful uh, public document which basically asked the question, look, are, are IBAs helping communities get healthier? And the answer to that is we don't know. Uh, some opportunities to address that question are, are, are available, um, and, and one interesting one was the one term, one condition of the IIBA sign between uh, Agnigo Eagle Mines and the KIA for the Meadowbank project, where they have an obligation to produce an annual wellness report, uh, which would go a little bit further than just mere socioeconomics. Uh, and, and, and require the uh, developer to, to uh, complete personal interviews, focus group sessions, surveys, case studies, etc. cetera. Um, I had been invited by the Hamlet to do some independent uh, documentation of how the Hamlet was experiencing the Meadowbank mine. As a result of that, uh, they reached out to me again to try and uh, work with them, with money from Agnigo Eagle to, to develop uh, more systematic means of tracking community well-being using their own indicators. Uh, many of you probably know this project. Uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, art uh, done on stone by one of the local artists, the Road to the Mine, which is about 110 kilometers north of, of Baker. Uh, so AM is, is paying for the work, uh, and the Hamlet has taken on the, the task of trying to develop, as I said, indicators that meet community conceptions of well-being, and then we'd have a basis to track them over time. I wish I could present you these, I'm afraid, are hypothetical results. I wish I could present you actual results, but that project has stalled, and, uh, and if anyone has solutions <coughs> for it, I, I'd welcome them. Uh, the Hamlet is uh, uh, feeling concerned that, that what might come out may not be as favorable as it should. They understandably um, want to have control over the process, but we are at a stalled point where they're not even enabling survey. So I'm afraid I have to, Chris, go south of 60 to give you some examples where we have indeed been able to not only develop the indicators, which, which we have done in, in, in Baker Lake, but also use them to populate a baseline of community conditions. And we've done so with uh, two communities in Northern Ontario and uh, with the, uh, the SCAPI of Kawachikamak in, in Northern Quebec on the Labrador border. Uh, look, can I just run through these very quickly just to give you a sense of of how this work is done, and it's certainly been of interest to uh, community members that I've, I've met with elsewhere. And of course, the Community Vitality Index folks here in Happy Valley Goose Bay have been doing a similar exercise, so I'm delighted to see that, that happening. Um, so we've completed baselines of community well-being using community indicators, community generator, generated in indicators in both Webequay and Yamaton. Webequay being the closest to the so-called ring of fire uh, of an area of, of great mineral potential, especially focused on chromite. Um, the way it's done is, here we are in a greenfield setting, no prior developments. Uh, we basically uh, enable the community to engage themselves on fundamental questions about who you are as a people, what are your values, what are you uh, concerned about in the context of possible mine development, what, what do you hope to get out of it. 
uh, that is then used by steering committees made up of, of community representatives, typically health workers, social workers, have a better sense, who would then convert all that material into a set of indicators, which are then used to populate a household survey. Uh, and ask questions such as, in the Amazon, do children 12 and under play outside without supervision? In the case of Yamatan, there were about 141 well-being indicators converted into 117 survey questions. What was exciting for them is 85 of those questions were revealing information that had never been collected before. And that, that was the purpose of the exercise, to get below that which is asked by Stats Canada or is available through tax filings, etc. Uh, the First Nation Statistical Institute, which like NAHO doesn't exist anymore, uh, was available to assist in the early days of developing that that um, questionnaire. It was administered using a laptop, which afforded privacy, uh, touch screen, people could answer questions, then that the answer would disappear and not be accessible, uh, which was an important uh, condition for some of the questions. And the uh, com completed with about 127 of 215 households in, in Fort Hope. In terms of some of the outcomes, they belong to Yamatang, but Yamatang is happy to share about five. I'll just give you one as an example. For them, sharing of food was a, was a critical variable. They would like to see if, if mining comes. They want to know whether something like this would go up or go down over time. And as you can see that, uh, that there is some sharing of food going on, uh, but uh, about 40% for a modest one to five times per year. Uh, there are some households that, 7% uh, of households that are doing this on a routine basis, 21 plus times. Interestingly, in Webequate, uh, and they, I'm not in a position to share any of the results from Webequate, they didn't like the household survey approach. We like that because we can really be sure of who, who's participated and who hasn't and check them off. Um, so instead, open houses were held in, in the band hall over a series of nights, over uh, two one-week sessions spread out by about a month. And we had a facilitation team of about 14 who, who helped uh, representatives of household complete the survey. It's an OG Cree community where 80% of the households, 90% of the households are, are speaking OG Cree. And so it was essential that, uh, that individuals with those language skills were, were helping to complete the, uh, the surveys. And I was amazed at how open people were to completing surveys. We started to explain the ethics protocol, and they said, just give us a survey, let's get it going. They were ready to do the work. They understood what it was all about. My last example comes from a little bit closer to here, on the border between Labrador and Quebec. In the Scapi Nation, Kamachikamak, was interested in this kind of an exercise. And we did a similar process to that in, in Yamatang and Webequay. Values, hopes, concerns, translated into indicators, shifted into survey questions. Uh, this was a, an exercise that uh, was similarly embraced by leadership and administrators, uh, and so we are, uh, had an easy, surprisingly easy time. Household surveys were completing the $30 grocery vouchers uh, for participation. Uh, what I think was additionally interesting about this in terms of results was that uh, well, one of the indicators they wanted was level of happiness, which many of you know is a pretty good proxy for a whole bunch of things. Uh, but they were... Uh, they were keen enough to also suggest that a local artist take some of these really boring graphics and convert them into uh, images that were more intuitive, sticking with the same proportions. Uh, this is the level of happiness as of 2012. Here too, uh, quite regular use of, of the native language, the Scapi language, uh, often and always was conflated. And so you can see this graphic nicely captures the same. So over time, we can show time series evidence with changing graphics, uh, with images that they're familiar with, colors, schemes that, that, that they like, they're used to. And uh, so I'm quite pleased to have been able to be associated with, not, not the originator of it, please be clear, associated with that kind of work. My last point, Chris, is that I, one of my great fears around IBAs is that a lot of the negotiations and, and, and opportunities uh, offered to communities in terms of raising expectations occurred uh, in the upswing of the commodity, uh, uh, well, just in this period, starting around 2003, 2004, peaking in 2010 and 11. Um, one of the big questions that people like Tom Patton, of course, are asking is, are we going to see a return to these highs, or, or is this whole period just anomalous? Is 10% annual growth in China something we'll never see again, perhaps for good reason? Uh, and, and should we get used to working in this kind of environment? 
And I think that the messages that were sent to communities across the country during the, the, the price boom uh, were problematic. Um, and, they, and they raised expectations, and, and, and especially in a place like the Ring of Fire, where now it looks like there's years away from any kind of a viable proposal. I think this is a challenge for negotiations, it's a challenge uh, for implementation of existing agreements, and it's something we should all be conscious of. But on the wrong track, I'd appreciate knowing now instead of at the RESDA meeting two years from now. So please, I welcome feedback. And if anyone is keen to collaborate on projects, I welcome the opportunity. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Mike.